Uh, dear all, hello. Uh, my name is Luisa Klebnikova. Uh, I'm one of key organizers of this webinar of, on 30 years of the Oslo Accords. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, the lessons of Oslo peace process and prospects uh, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We made this event with fantastic experts from different countries. Uh, it's a very special event for me personally uh, to have this webinar of, on the Oslo Records. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being a part of our webinar. During these horrible uh, and hopeless, actually, times, um, I want to say that my heart goes to Israelis uh, and other people in Israel who are affected by horrific terror attacks uh, by Palestinian radical groups, and as well to Palestinian civilians who are also affected by violence and destruction. I decided not to postpo postpone this webinar. Uh, because uh, now than ever, it's very important to talk about this long and devastated conflict. So we are going to start. Uh, today, our, our webinar uh, got two sessions, 20 minutes for one presentation, um, and the discussion and Q&A in the end of each session. Uh, our listeners uh, can use chat and Q&A uh, also uh, on uh, this Zoom platform. So please, please do it uh, because it's very important to have uh, discussion, uh, polemics. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce and to welcome our first session. Um, our first session of this webinar is uh, lessons from the Oslo process. And uh, it will be open by presentation uh, by head of department for Israel studies, Institute of Oriental Studies, um, Russian Academy of Sciences, former ambassador to Bahrain, uh, Viktor Smirnov, Dr. Viktor Smirnov. Uh, his presentation uh, will be on topic Israelis and Palestinians separated or integrated uh, after the Oslo Agreement. Viktor Yurevich, the floor is yours. Good day, colleagues. Uh, I would like to say that uh, Bahrain is Bahrain, but uh, my life, diplomatic life, was much connected with uh, Israel. I was minister in uh, not in the government, but in the Russian embassy in uh, uh, Tel Aviv. So uh, Oslo process passed through my fingers. And uh, uh, those books which were issued by the foreign ministry of Israel are always with me on my shelf, not far. This is the books of hopes, which are called the agreement on the Gaza Strip and Jericho and Israeli-Palestinian interim agreement on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. This is the basis of Oslo process. And uh, today I am far from saying that we are present on the funerals of the Oslo process. So uh, those the days are tragic and I put this particular kippah on my head to say condolences to the Israeli people after these dramatic events. This is not an ordinary keeper for funerals. This is a keeper which was on me during the funerals of uh, Prime Minister Rabin, which was killed by Igal Amir. And I was accompanying Prime Minister Chernomirdin on his funerals. Therefore, this Kippa is always in front of me on my table. I look at it with a big hope that the events will come back to this normal trend. As to the substance, we speak today not on the latest developments in Gaza and Israel. We speak about Oslo. 
and Oslo starts to my mind in the late 80s, which was not less dramatic, less dramatic, but dramatic with the first intifada and the attempts to find the way out of this, that situation. We remember how it was difficult for the Prime Minister Rambin and Shimon Peres to get to the negotiating table. We remember how it was difficult for us, for the Soviets, for the Americans, to understand that negotiating pro process with the PLO is possible. And the shaking hands in September 1993 in Washington is something extra in the peace process. The developments after is totally, could become a totally a basis for the understanding between the two people. When I uh, choose the name of my presentation today, separated or integrated, I thought much in a big percentage for the coexistence between the two persons. As many in today's world, maybe I was misled by uh, the more or less calm uh, situation. But the pressure, which was not diffused in the beginning of this uh, century, uh, resulted in what we have today. I may say that uh, we made all who, is, uh, who speaks in favor of Oslo process, we made a big mistake. Not we, but the whole Israelis, Palestinians, international community, we gave the chance to oppositions to the peace process, to take the upper land. It doesn't mean who are they. Igal Amir, Baruch Kalshtey, uh, this nice guy who is still alive. I show you the newspaper, which is of 2005, two months before the elect October, exactly 18 years ago. Two years, uh, two, three months before the elections in uh, the Palestinian te uh, territories, when Hamas won and has become to the and in 2007, uh, Hamas made, I can name this a coup d'etat, and we received what we have received. All the attempts, all war operations, then were in vain. Uh, and I don't want to speak about the present, the present events. Still, blood is, uh, tension is high, uh, violence is high, and uh, time will come, we assess it in a proper way, the consequences of this humanitarian catastrophe, both for Israel and Palestine. But those years, to my mind, there was a chance to establish more understanding, more common ground for uh, development. We have the formula which should be implemented to States for two people, not every each state for each people, every state for I don't have it. one state for one people. It should be two states for two people. It means that there should be interconnection between the two states. Never mind that the state was not created. Let it be Palestinian National Administration. Attempts were made, definitely. Definitely. I remember this huge plan of uh, late. Uh, Shimon Peres of computerizing the whole Middle East. I remember this uh, intensive uh, discussions about water projects for the Middle East. Red Sea, Dead Sea, I remember Casablanca multilateral, when uh, a lot of experts and nation, from different nations discussed the Israeli proposal of 200 billion dollars, how they will build the desalinization stations, um, take canals, and so on and so on. Unfortunately, we don't have the continuation uh, for that, though there are still people 
who are devoting uh, their attention and will to this. I should refer to my predecessor, Dmitry Mariasis, who wrote uh, beautiful books one year or two years ago, how to establish digital connection between the Israeli industries and the Palestinian environment, how it could uh, help the Palestinians and Israelis to understand. Maybe it is a fantasy in today's world, but people are thinking in that way. People should live together. And on the eve of the catastrophe, which happened in 2006, 2007, there was such a document. There were many of them like this. It is called Palestinian-Israeli Security Coordination and Cooperation for January, October 2005. What is the last point of this document of 59 points? I read, it should be noted that the two sides fully cooperated on all security related issues of Gaza disengagement. This is what the officials say. Is it a mistake? It is a lie or what? Because here I repeat the words of Hamas leader, Zahar, Mahmoud Zahar, more kidnappings if Israel doesn't release prisoners. How can we combine this? How can we? We are responsible for what is going today. All of us are responsible. And uh, time will come, these books I mentioned will come back on the tables of negotiators. Without them, difficult to understand that people will understand each other. Though so there are uh, their own mislabs, or I don't know how to say this, uh, uh, fantasies in those books. Too much attention to economic cooperation, security cooperation, all, a, a lot of the detail, people like Eir Hirschfeld, Ron Pundak, uh, Abu Ala, worked hard to move these uh, documents uh, realistic. Well, what we get, we know, we got this. This is the wall. What will be with this wall, I don't know, but it is definitely not, uh, no, not useful for two people living together. This is my vision of the situation. Now I am very pessimistic. I expect huge violence and I expect huge differences between uh, the two people. I don't know what happened after. Do we get a new wave of Palestinian refugees? Do we have a huge humanitarian operation of uh, the United the auspices of the United Nations? Who knows? It will uh, difficult. It is difficult to say. Now I promise not to speak about the present situation. But I see, if we speak about the two nations, for two countries, for Palestine and Israel, we should return to these documents and to work again. It will, uh, it will demand new clever people, new way of thinking, but I don't see any other way for coming, uh, for, for living for Israelis and Palestinians. Thank you. Political will. Political will, definitely, definitely. Only people with political will could be clever. Dr. Spenov, thank you. thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I think uh, that we should uh, uh, go um, presentation by presentation, and then uh, in the end of the session, it will be Q&A. Uh, please, our listeners, use the chat, uh, use Q&A, ask questions, make some comments. It's very, very important. It's not only to listen our speakers, but to ask questions. It's a unique opportunity to ask questions about this important uh, uh, topic. Um, I'm honored to give a floor now for wonderful Menachem Klein. Professor for of department, excuse me, Department uh, of Political Science, Bar Ilan University, who is going to give us uh, a presentation on Israelis, uh, Palestinians, and Americans uh, reviewing Oslo after thirty years. Menachem, please, the floor is yours. Yes. 
Thank you very much, Luisa. I'm sorry that I cannot be physically with you in Moscow. I look forward for the my first visit in uh, in Russia and Moscow. Uh, Always welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to to start with uh, the simple question. What do we mean when we say Oslo? So in the public discourse, I'm going to speak about the public discourse that uh, we had, we, I say, Israelis, Americans, and Palestinians uh, commemorating the 30th anniversary of Oslo, Oslo at 30. So what, what we mean when we say Oslo, and actually what, what Oslo means in the public discourse. So there are two, two different meanings to Oslo. The first meaning is the legal document that was signed between the, the parties. So this is the subject of many studies on international law. And I'm not going to deal with this. I'm not an expert on international law. So this is far beyond my, uh, my, my education. <clears throat> the other meaning is not only the documents, but everything that happened from September 93 till the end of, the, of what we call Oslo negotiation or the peace process. Actually, it ended with uh, with a Kerry mission. Okay, when Kerry, John Kerry, Secretary of State, American Secretary of State, ended his mission in 2017 or so, uh, 16 or 17, uh, this, this marked, in my view, the end of uh, of Oslo process, peace process. Since then, there were no negotiations along Oslo. There were trials to get the sides to agree on a very limited issues unrelated to Oslo peace process. But when we speak on everything that happened from 93 to 2016 or 17, we mean also Ken David summit, we mean the second intifada, we mean uh, we we mean the elections, the Palestinian elections in uh, 96, 2006, uh, and, and so on. Everything that happened uh, along these years. Now, this September, when when so many people discussed Oslo at 30, I I the it was it's very interesting to see or to sum up what the discourse was all about, how they related to Oslo. <clears throat> and uh, this is the subject of my presentation. So first of all, let me start with the conspiracy theory approach. So in the public debate, and, it's, and this is not new, new it started already in 93. The conspiracy theory uh, ruled over the mind of several people. So I, I divide the conspiracy theory into two. The, the, the first theory says that Oslo was a Palestinian terrorist conspiracy against Israel, a conspiracy by the PLO. They never meant to make peace with Israel. They, they always wanted to implement the Palestinian National Covenant of, of 68 and destroy Israel. And they misled everybody. And it's a bunch of terrorists that Israel by mistake and let them enter into historical Palestine, um, and uh, uh, and they want to destroy uh, destroy Israel. This is this is the um, the first 
uh, the first example of conspiracy theory. Now, the mirror image of this con theory is the uh, conspiracy theory that radical Palestinians uh, raised on an, a, an Israeli conspiracy against the Palestinian people and PLO's self-determination goal. Israel stick to its settler colonialism policy. It never gave up its, uh, its this policy. And Israel misled the Palestinians. It started with very bad intentions. Never, Israel never meant making peace and historical compromise with the, uh, the, the Palestinians. Israel maintained its control system over the Palestinian land and people. Uh, Oslo. Uh, uh, so this is the uh, uh, this is the the mirror image of the conspiracy theory. It's wrong not only because it is a conspiracy theory. Uh, this ap approach assumes that history is deterministic that what happened at the end shows that this was the grand design and the master plan from start. Not taking into account that something can happen on the way, down the way. So, um, um, so th this is the methodological wrong of the conspiracy theory. And historians, also, some right-wing or Israeli or Jewish and sometimes Palestinian good historians, they use this uh, mistaken view to evaluate Oslo process. Uh, actually, we, uh, we, we have to bear in mind that this, this theory also assumes that it was a conspiracy against the Palestinians. This argument also goes, let's say, has a, 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 another dimension. And it goes as the following. Oslo was fully implemented. Oslo was fully implemented. From start, Oslo meant um, occupying and then during the Palestinian, uh, the Israeli occupation over the Palestinians. And actually Oslo on the ground lasts longer than the Jordanian occupation or the Israeli Dariot occupation prior to the first intifada. So it is a master plan that Israel just changed the tactics, but not the, the strategic goal to, to rule the uh, Palestinians. So this is the, the conspiracy theory. And an opposite version of uh, a, a op opposite version of uh, of this theory is the following. Oslo is alive. But Oslo is alive not according to, not because it is a conspiracy of Israelis how to rule the Palestinians. Oslo is, is alive argue few Os pro-Oslo advocates, not, criticize, not critics of Oslo, but advocates of Oslo. They evaluate Oslo positively. They argue that the mutual recognition actually is in force, the mutual recognition of uh, Israel and the, and, and the PLO. So uh, uh, it has an a, psychological impact, the mutual recognition has a psychological impact on both of parties. For instance, Dennis Ross argued this summing up Oslo at 30. The, P, the Palestinian Authority institutions exist and operate on their territorial base, however limited, but still exist. So Oslo is on, operates on the ground the Palestinian public wishes having general elections to Palestinian Authority institutions. So in a way, hardly life, but 
Oslo is a, is alive on and and on the ground. Oslo created um, a, a Palestinian Israeli independence that might serve as a starting point for future agreement. It's a it's a it's a it's a wish a an Israeli Palestinian independence wish that might serve as a starting point for a future agreement. So the ground is not empty from positive starts for that Oslo brought about. So not 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 everything is dead and 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 over. This is a very a small majority a small major a small minority stick to this view. The major the majority in the discourse argue or conclude that Oslo is dead. That Oslo process is dead. There is no peace process. No Palestinian state in the making exists. Just the opposite. Israel expands its settlements and there is no vision or no base to hope that the Palestinian state will ever be established. Uh, Oslo, Oslo doomed to fail from start because the Israeli leaders unwillingness to evacuate settlements. So the Israeli leadership did not want to evacuate settlements. The settlements, they decided, and the PLO unfortunately agreed to keep the settlements deep in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and they caused the failure of Oslo, and Oslo was destroyed by, by, in, not, by, by many spoilers, including the decision in purpose of Oslo negotiators to keep the settlements where they are. Impossible, and if you read the Israeli cabinet minutes, the full protocol of the of the cabinet meeting approving Oslo in September uh, 93, you see that the cabinet was fully aware that the settlements are a time bomb that keeping the settlements is a time bomb for the whole pro process. But they were powerless and unwilling, they unwilling to evacuate them. That's that, that, that's a, a tragedy in 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 my my view that the cabinet acknowledged from start that keeping settlements where they are sabotage the peace process and will impose on Israel to de facto annex them. What really happened? Uh, moreover, the widespread of settlements all over the West Bank during Oslo years, Oslo peace process years, uh, and the, including in the heavily populated Gaza Strip, they impose on Israel to develop a typical colonial regime that forbid the natives free movement inside the West Bank, and from there to Israel unless it is permitted. So before Oslo, I and actually before 91, uh, during the Intifada, every Palestinian could travel freely. From 91 and much more so 93 on, every Palestinian was forbid traveling freely unless he, he or she showed a permission. And this was done in, in order to secure the settlers that refused to build a barrier, that, that a barrier between them and, and Israel per se will impose on them to show this, that, that they, have, they have to show a permit. So they, they insisted as Israeli citizens to have free movement, which by definition, impose on the Palestinian the denial of their right of free movement. 
another issue that came up during the discourse on Oslo after 30 years is the, the question, who bears most responsibility for Oslo failure? And this is a, a, a very interesting question to deal with. The argument in both sides is goes as following. We uh, also experience shows that we were ready to make fundamental concessions, but the other side showed it's unwilling to make peace. Now the other side is depends on who is the speaker. Once the, 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 the Palestinians, they say, we, we showed we were there. We, we do our, our utmost to show that we are ready for, for peace. But Israel, the colonialist power, refused and rejected. And vice versa, the, on the other hand, the Israeli argument is, no, no, no the Palestinian terrorism and the unwillingness to accept the, the Jewish state uh, destroyed Oslo peace process. We we were very honest in, in uh, our willing to make peace. Let's go to the to the next issue that was that is debated uh, was debated. Menachem, three minutes. Okay. Uh, Oslo was flawed or even tragic mistake and developed, maybe Oslo was a tragic mistake, but it developed negatively against its architecture's hopes. So Oslo, the, the Oslo architectures has very good plan to move forward, but, but the spoilers determined it down the road. And the list of spoilers and mistakes are many. Not, not only Galamir and Goldstein and settlements expansion and so on. One argument says that, that, that the Palestinian, the way the Palestinian negotiated, the skills of the Palestinian negotiators, the, the Israeli proposals in, in Camp David, the, the absence of an American, a strong American mediator, honest broker, because the Americans backed, fully backed the Israeli, the Israeli stance, and this destroyed the negotiation, and so on. I can go uh, into, into details on, on this issue. Uh, but the, the, Byproduct of this strategy is no, the negotiators were fine, but the spoilers, the spoilers bear the, the, the most responsibility for blocking the uh, Oslo peace process. Is, is the conflict solvable, solvable comprehensively? This is also another issue, another debate, people, yeah, the, there is a strong today in present Israel, or yeah, not today after the, and the, during this conflict, but in recent years, there is a strong view or strategy that that um, full Israeli-Palestinian peace is unachievable, so let's move to conflict management, or shrinking the conflict, or Bypassing the Palestinians by by coming from the outside with the Abraham Accords and with the Saudi Arabia normalization agreement, etc., and 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 control the Palestinians because there is no hope of uh, achieving a comprehensive peace between Israel and, and uh, Palestinians. Uh, it, it, does it make sense to continue upholding to two-state solution? This is another issue that was brought up uh, in the, the debate. In the debate, many came to the conclusion that the two-state solution is dead, uh, strong, more so 
during this conflict that we are with that we witness going on at this moment even uh, that it is dead and then everything is open for um uh, for, for the discussion what is achievable what is not achievable um and, and so on so oslo after 30 years brought up many many um uh, many subjects um, which are uh, very interesting to see and I would say including me 30 years ago I did not I was not aware to this subject I I think that every one of us uh, learned from the uh, from his the history of Oslo peace process uh, and has his or her conclusions about, uh, about about the negotiation. I would like to share with you only one. I do think that it was a huge mistake to describe Oslo or to discuss Oslo as a peace process. Oslo was not a peace process. Oslo was not a peace agreement. Oslo was an agreement, interim agreement, only an interim agreement, not final status, not a full peace agreement. It was an interim agreement on a limited autonomy to the Palestinians under Israeli control. Unfortunately, the, uh, the leadership, the Israeli leadership, the Palestinian leadership, the American leadership, the international community, uh, described it as a peace process. To, to celebrate it in the White House as a peace was a huge mistake. It raises expectations. It encouraged the spoilers. It raises the expectations of the Israeli public and the Palestinian public. And then when each of them were disappointed, they, try, they started blaming the other. A byproduct of this raising expectations was the letter of mutual recognition between Rabin and Arafat. It was a huge mistake to, to ask the, the Palestinians to sign the letter and to, to, to initiate the letter. The letter is totally in balance. The Palestinians recognize the right of Israel to exist. Mm -hmm. Israel never recognized the Palestinian state the right of the Palestinians to have an independent state, they just recognize that the PLO represents the Palestinian people. So the, the Palestinians, the PLO made a concession that should have been made, made within the context of final status agreement, full peace, while Israel made a very small concession in the context of a limited autonomy, of, of, of an interim agreement, perhaps even less than an autonomy, less than autonomy. So that's, that, 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 that's created expectations. And here started the, uh, the long road to demolish Oslo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Menachem. Uh, big thanks to the first speaker, Dr. Smirnov. A uh, big thanks to Menachem. Uh, I think we are going to have some polemics on every presentation. And please, 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 our listeners, uh, use the chat, use the Q&A. It's a unique opportunity to ask these amazing uh, experts questions to make some remarks comments etc please 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 do it uh we are we are going to, uh, as you as far as everyone see we are recording uh this webinar we are going to post it on our youtube channel uh but still it's a unique opportunity to be a part of our event uh, right now uh so uh, we are continuing um and uh, um the next speaker uh, and um, of our first session, it's my uh, forever scientific advisor, uh, Dr. Tatiana Nasenka. 
she's the leading research fellow, Department for Israel and Jewish Community Studies, uh, Institute of Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Science. And her presentation will be, could the Oslo process have a chance to succeed? Tatiana Selna, the floor is yours, please. Uh, hello, everybody. And um, I can't uh, start this uh, presentation without reference to the present uh, events, uh, to the the war which is taking place, uh, which is developing in the region which we are all studying for such a long time. And uh, I must present my deepest condolences to all the Israeli people who have suffered such a terrible attack. And at the same time, I don't know how we shall call the Israeli response this time, because usually when such wars uh, uh, take place, uh, we say, and the international community says that uh, the Israelis uh, make a disproportionate strike. Uh, I see those terrible pictures of Gaza I see those uh, devastations and uh, the ruins of uh, the uh, whole grand city. And I can't uh, help uh, uh, presenting my deepest condolences and my deepest sympathy also with the civil people of, uh, uh, with the civil inhabitants of Gaza Strip uh, who are now, uh, uh, are in lack of food, of medicine, of medical help. And uh, this is a terrible situation, uh, which the whole world and all the uh, human people uh, can't see as normal as well. Uh, so now I'll go back to our topic, to our Oslo process and it's um, uh, a reference to the present time. I prefer, for, first of all, I would say that to some extent I will repeat uh, those uh, points which were uh, uh, the present, uh, um, which the previous presenter already uh, touched. And uh, uh, preparing for this event, I was also looking through um, many opinions that uh, exist about uh, uh, Oslo process, what it was really. Uh, was it a ruse on the Palestinian part to use the Palestinian-Israeli agreement in order to increase terror and violence against Israelis? Or was it a miscalculation of the Israeli leaders uh, to transfer the responsibility for internal security to Palestinian Authority? Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, the Palestinian Authority, who, as uh, we know today, was not up to the challenge. Uh, so uh, the Arabs and Palestinians uh, even say that it was a cruel hoax aimed to conceal the fact that the Israelis will always find an excuse to deny Palestinians a state of their own in historic Palestine. So I will, uh, uh, I will uh, cite, I will um, make reference to many expressions uh, uh, in this text to the, uh, uh, to the, those uh, who uh, have uh, anything to say about this process. And uh, what really was it, Oslo process? Why it led to such disastrous events uh, like uh, the Second Intifada and uh, like uh, the situation, the wars that followed after between Hamas and uh, Israel. Uh, and a lot of 
uh, was written and said about the theory of Oslo. And uh, I would like to discuss how the theory of Oslo and flaws of Oslo explain or make us better understand the reality of Israeli-Palestinian relations in the following years, even to the present time. Uh, uh, I, for that purpose, I want to show that Oslo was a such a testing ground that disclosed the differences in political thinking, in goal setting, in psychology, which are not easy to bridge and which are, uh, are staying unsurmountable even up to these days. Uh, to begin with, I will discuss the goal setting during this process. How did the Israeli leaders see the goals in uh, discussing the signing of uh, the Declaration of Principles? I will also make reference to those documents the previous uh, presenter um, uh, uh, attracted our attention to. It's those uh, protocols of the meeting of the uh, Israeli government in August uh, 1993, and when they are discussing the possibility to approve the declaration of Oslo. And it was stated, the Palestinian Authority will receive only powers that Israel agrees to transfer to it. That meant that the source of power of the new Palestinian entity was not the Palestinian people, but the occupier. And uh, the Minister of uh, Justice openly said at that time, when I re read the text, I see they only have what we agree to, and there is nothing beyond that. These are the words which were pronounced at that uh, historic meeting, historical meeting. Uh, and what about the other side? How they saw the goals of uh, the uh, 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 process which was uh, set uh, forth? Uh, what were the motives of the PLO and its leaders? And the, here I will make a reference to what our uh, colleague, a very well uh, known Arabist, who is unfortunately no more with us, uh, Grigory Kosich, how he um, described the goals of the Palestinians. Uh, he wrote that Oslo agreements were supported by the majority of the Palestinian public as the first step toward a, towards a Palestinian state. And at the same time, uh, the uh, PLO solved, first of all, the problems of gaining national space and countering Hamas. Uh, so signing the Declaration of uh, Principles to his mind showed the weakness of the, of the PLO because it didn't provide for the opportunity to fully exercise its sovereign rights over both regions of the national territory. Uh, and uh, I also found a very interesting uh, explanation of the well-known American diplomat, Aaron David Miller, who was uh, the, who took part in the Oslo process by himself. And uh, he said that he was uh, always um, uh, trying to find uh, Arafat's personal motives why he accepted the Oslo Accords. Uh, and to his mind, it was uh, the way to validate himself and the PLO as the only legitimate avenue for dealing with the Palestinians. And he said it was the triumph of personal ego over national interest. Uh, so uh, these, uh, uh, these views show that from the outset, there were some discrepancies between the parties as regards the final goals. There was no term Palestinian state in the Uslo documents. 
Rabin and Paris named among the main diplomatic achievements the fact that Israeli diplom uh, dipl diplomats initially managed to exclude from the topic topics uh, discussions of the most acute problems like Jerusalem, uh, the, 90, uh, the 67 borders, uh, the settlements, and so or Jewish settlements, and so on. Uh, Besides, there was strongly felt misbalance between the parties, Palestinians' dependence on what the Israelis would, would permit or not. Uh, together with uh, the visible differences as regards the final goals, it, it's created the atmosphere of distrust and suspicion. And I remember very well, I was to some extent the witness of that, uh, of those events because I was at that time in Israel in the 90s. And I remember very well that situation uh, uh, that caused a great confusion in Cairo in 1994 when uh, Arafat was refusing to sign, to sign a, a, another agreement. And the event was uh, shown live on TV, and it was a very great confusion at that uh, time. Uh, and it was the evidence of Arafat's hesitations and doubts about the, the whole construction. Uh, and uh, at this point, I would like to say some words about the role of the leaders in the first direct talks between Israel and uh, the Peru. <coughs> Uh, there was much talk about uh, the possible uh, positive developments of the Oslo process if Rabin had not been assassinated. But Rabin, from the very outset, was not prepared to commit to any agreed outcome. Nobody knows Rabin's uh, approach uh, to the con uh, conflict score issues to Jerusalem, uh, and uh, dismantling of settlements and so on. Uh, he never saw interim agreements as irreversible because there was also a doubt about the capacity of the Palestinians for statehood. So dri driven by domestic politics, Rabin was unwilling or unable to limit that alone hold uh, settlement expansion. Uh, with his death, the new leadership was even more reluctant to change the settlement policy. All that diminished Palestinian willingness to implement uh, their own commitments under Oslo. And what about the Palestinian side? Did, uh, did if, uh, uh, Arafat really had the have the courage to fight Hamas? Uh, did he ever tried to do it uh, because that was the actions of Hamas and the like organizations, extremist organizations that destroyed everything with their terror attacks. Uh, for the Palestinian intra, uh, polit uh, in internal political life, uh, terror played an important part of that time. Uh, Authority tried to channel uh, the growing dissatisfaction with the public of its rule uh, to, into the direction against Israel. And uh, Arafat, who never abandoned the use of the violence, uh, could not or would not do anything to prevent terrorist attacks or arrest the perpetrators. I'm sure that uh, he was also very much influenced by those uh, assassinations of Sadat and then of Rabin. He who has, for the whole of his life, was so cautious to escape uh, death traps. For this time, he uh, didn't want to be trapped, to be caught by Hamas. So Palestinian territories were quickly destroying the narrow base supporting the peace process in Israel. Uh, 
Evidently, on both sides, the leaders were not up to their task to solve the burning problems that had the most devastating impact on the peace process. And the last point, but not the least, which I want to touch, uh, is uh, the reaction of the public, the reaction, the situation on both sides in Israel and in Palestine, uh, and the attitude to those negotiations. Uh, the negotiations were conceived and implemented as a top process. There were no mechanism for confidence building measures in grassroots uh, public segments. Uh, uh, and meanwhile, processes developing in Israel and Palestinian societies went against peaceful efforts. Extremist West Bank settlers, empowered by, by radical rabbis, were inciting violence, demonizing Rabin. And at least uh, one, Yigal Amir, began to believe that the only way to stop Oslo was to kill Rabin. And among Palestinians, the loss of confidence in the settlement intensif intensified throughout the second half of the 1990s. If in June 95, almost 75% of respondents expressed support for this process, then in August 94, only 55%. So we see that in three years, there was a uh, a decrease of about 20 per, more than 20 percent uh, in um, support of the process in the Palestinian society. Uh, and the charges were brought against both participants uh, by Palestinians. Israel was charged uh, to refuse to resolve the issue of East Jerusalem and uh, deliberately explaining expanding the network of Jewish settlements in the West Bank, and the Palestinian administration did not meet people's hopes for the rapid creation of a Palestinian state. Uh, so, what I want to emphasize, uh, the Oslo process fails, uh, failed because the parties pursued different conflicting goals, because the leaders bound by their internal conflicts were unable to comply with obligations because societies on both sides were not ready to move toward, towards each other to recognize the needs and fears of the other party. And what is it, the result? What we see after 30 years? To my mind, the Oslo lessons have not been learned. Uh, the political goals on both sides are still unclear. And we can't say that Hamas uh, proclamations to destroy Israel is a realistic one. The leaders are more preoccupied with their personal survival. The public are even more hostile to each other. Uh, is it absolutely hopeless? Is, are there any other opinions on how to proceed. And there are some uh, uh, figures which I have from the recent polls, uh, which were uh, uh, taken in Israel and Palestine. And the polls show that there are about 36%, it's the figures, for, it's uh, the polls, uh, uh, of September 19, uh, of this year. And uh, well, the polls show that uh, about 36% of Israelis uh, think that uh, it was uh, correct to sign the accords, 36%, uh, against 39 who are uh, of the opposite opinion. Among the Arabs, there is a, uh, <coughs> the result is contrary, with 39 believing it was correct and 28 believing it wasn't. This means that the request for peaceful settlement has not been lost in both societies. And 
I think that it is uh, a very a, a very important uh, uh, sign of how uh, the societies see it, because the third part of the uh, Palestinians and the Israelis think that it was correct, it was uh, useful, it was important to sign uh, those uh, declarations and to uh, to proceed with those uh, with the peace process. Uh, so let us hope that uh, nothing is lost. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasenko, Tatiana Selna. Спасибо огромное. Thank you. Uh, we are on time. Uh, big thanks to three of our uh, speakers of the first session. It's uh, we are. Uh, we love time and we follow our time uh, rules. Thank you very much. It's very important because it's webinar. It's not a uh, roundtable discussion or some conference it's a webinar. Um, so uh, again, big thanks uh, to three speakers. And now we are going to um, to our discussion um, part. Uh, and we have some questions to all of our first session speakers. Uh, first, uh, first question uh, that I see um, to all of you, actually, uh, and I'm going to read it um, loudly, I hope so. So the question is, since the process was named after Oslo, how do you evaluate the role of Norway? And do you see now any prospects for using small states diplomacy in this conflict, including the current escalation? Who is going to answer this question? Menachem, please. Okay, I, I would like to recommend you, all of you and the person who put forward this question, to read the special, in the special issue of Israel Studies Review, published in September, uh, I, together with Dr. Uh, Professor Rafaela de Sarto, I was a guest editor of this special volume. There are two, two articles dealing exactly with this question. One about the Norway role in bringing about uh, Oslo process, what role Norway played in the process, very interesting, and another article on small states' uh, role in mediation, international mediation, uh, taking into, as, a, as a, a case study, the role of Denmark, that is much less known but Denmark played a role leading to, to Oslo. So I recommend you to, to read the, these two, two articles. Thank you very much, Menachem. Maybe someone else wants to reply to this question. If not, we're going to continue. Tatiana Sjöldna? No, 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 I, I, not now. Allow me. Yep. I like Dr. Smirnov, I of like course. small nations. I like Terry Larson, Mona Yule, and his efforts. But we have a fixed Russian and not only Russian position. We have an international quartet of Russia, United States, the European Union, and United Nations. Middle Let's East quarter. Not... Hmm? Middle East Let's... quarter. Yes, let's not look for small nations. We have big nations responsible for the continuation of the peace process. And let's revive the work of this very effective and potentially effective institution for negotiating process. Stop. This is my vision of this question. Thank you. Quartet is waiting. Each country, each uh, uh, part of this has a special 
representative of the Middle East who are still alive. They are working. They still see the, the possibility to continue coordination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, May I say? Yep, Dr. Nasenko, yes. I, I just want to say that to my mind, uh, uh, there is um, no different small countries or great powers who take responsibility uh, or take the charge or trying to take the charge of the process. Uh, I think that the most important is that the two parties decide uh, that they are ready to have uh, uh, talks, they are ready to take responsibilities uh, for solving those problems and uh, to sit at the table and to discuss on that. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much. Um, I would like to say that uh, this issue, what Menachem just said, Israel Studies Review, this issue on Oslo process made me think actually gave me this idea to have this webinar. So it's a good issue. Uh, I also recommend to read it. Um, um, unfortunately, I could not be a part of this issue. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's a, it's a good issue. I hope we are going to have our own issue of uh, from our department on Oslo and lessons and prospectus uh, of Oslo. So the another question. Um, to Dr. Smirnov, uh, was there any chance to tr transform Oslo into a workable plan? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I can I repeat. Mean, yeah, I understand. I understand. Oslo is a workable plan. Oslo should uh, have a continuation. And uh, if we take this thick book, I'm sorry. But it is written, it is written the, 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 in preamble that the government of the state of Israel and PLO recognizing that the aim of the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations within the current Middle East peace process. This is peace process. And uh, on May 4, 1999, there should be already the final top of the, now the talks of the final negotiations. It doesn't matter 1999 or, or 20 years more that the problem, that the process itself was uh, killed. This is a problem. Uh, definitely Oslo is a beautiful uh, uh, basis. Will it be in the end of the process, the Palestinian state or will be the Palestinian state in uh, conjunction and confederation with the Jordan or I don't know what. We failed to uh, develop the process itself, itself, and uh, definitely correctly uh, it was uh, said that uh, now people are discussing who is to blame, who is to blame, who is to blame. All are to blame. All are to blame. Uh, I would also add that uh, Oslo uh, was a, uh, a workable process and. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, it uh, that those uh, agreements which were signed uh, they witnessed that it was a uh, there were results and uh, the existence of the Palestinian Authority is a result of also process so uh, it was really. A, uh, uh, docu documents which uh, were, were signed, there were four, I, I suppose there were about four agreements which were signed. Uh, the other thing is that they were not, uh, um, uh, they were not uh, put into practice, and not all of them. And uh, uh, Intifada, uh, the second Intifada, uh, spoiled uh, much of what was achieved. But the process was just uh, workable when there were political will on both sides to uh, yeah, further uh, to proceed and to uh, to sign uh, those documents. Maybe one more word, Mr. Lowe. If you remember, it is not by chance that I have started the 
a presentation <laughs> from the late 80s, late 80s. You remember that on the 14th of May, 1989, Shamir Initiative was approved. And uh, it said, no talks to, P to the PLO. And uh, Rabin said then that I will never uh, talk to uh, Arafat to PLO, never. And it was uh, officially excluded in the Sh in Shamir plan that uh, negotiations with PLO uh, could, could uh, take place. And definitely it was a, uh, long, long efforts of the international community, Americans, Russians, uh, uh, to implement the Baker Initiative and to transfer it to Madrid process. And you remember that in 86, 87, 88, the partners for uh, Israelis in negotiations were presented at like notables from the uh, uh, heads of villages and represent representatives for negotiations in Cairo. You remember they were planned uh, with Schultz and with the uh, Baker uh, period. Uh, there were a list of those who could be a partner, but not Arafat. It was huge efforts for the Israeli leadership to convince themselves to talk to Prelo. Palestinian state will come. This is a result of the long, long process. Which state? How? We even didn't reach this uh, phase of uh, the final state status negotiation, including the status of Jerusalem, including the, the status of settlements. Uh, uh, there are many borders, borders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have also question by the way um on this different project how to resolve this conflict and the question is uh can we say that an idea of, of confederations establishment between israelis and palestinians is a good alternative to the two-state solution it's a uh, uh these days uh this year's big um discussions of two-state solutions, one-state solution, uh, uh, and uh, confeder Israel-Palestinian confederation. So maybe someone from our speakers can make a comment on it. About, I, okay. Yeah, I can I, start. Yeah. The, the confederation is, is between two independent states. So the, it's not federation, it's confederation. Confederation is is between two independent states. So, and the basic assumption is that two-state solution is relevant, but we should modify it in a way, uh, taking into consideration the many differences between Israel and the forthcoming Palestinian state or to be established Palestinian state, uh, many, many differences from culture, language, religion, history, uh, to infrastructure, economy, uh, um, manpower, skills, etc. I think that, and taking into consideration the geography, geostrategic elements in the region, I think that confederal arrangements are inevitable. So the, we, we must think on confederal arrangements, not a full confederation, but arrangements that build up confederal ties in, a, in certain, certain issues or certain fields. Uh, and we have to, to tailor it, or the, the decision makers have to tailor it very, very carefully. But, uh, but, but this is a good, good approach for, um, for the future. Uh, we have also to bear in mind that but the Palestinians never in history exercised one hour of full independence. 
even not one hour of full independence. They were occupied by the British Mandate and then the Jordanians and then the Israelis, etc. They want independence. They want to get rid from the Israelis. They don't want to see Israelis. Definitely they don't want the Israeli colonialism to return by other means, meaning economic superiority or whatever, or even security supervision. So confederal arrangements must meet Palestinian independence and sovereignty concerns. And so it should be tailored very carefully. Thank you very much, Menachem. It's uh, actually discussing the options, two-state solution, uh, one-state solution, and one um, and uh, confederation. It's my next uh, topic uh, to have a webinar, by the way. <laughs> okay. So we are going to discuss it a little bit later, um, um, more precise, uh, because it's very, very important and very um, interesting topic uh, to discuss uh, what is the better solution. And yes, I know a lot of, and Menachem also, know, we know a lot of, of our colleagues from uh, Israel studies who are for Israel-Palestinian confederation, but yeah, now you, you're talking about confederable arrangements. It's very interesting to discuss also. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Menachem, you have another one question, uh, and I'm going to read it loudly. Israeli settlers compromise 14% of the West Bank population without East Jerusalem. 20 percent of Israeli citizens are Arabs, 21 by the way. Uh, why isn't possible for the Israeli settlers to remain in the future Palestinian state, a slow abiding minority with Israeli citizenship and Palestinian res residents permit holding reasonable amounts of land for residential and production purposes within the framework of peace agreement after it's finally reached? Wow really hard to read it. It's a big question. On the same grounds, Palestinian refugees could live in Israel. So it's a more like comment and um, uh, question. Menachem, if you can uh, yeah. answer it. Okay, I will, because of the time concern, um, I yeah. will answer very shortly. Yeah. Uh, when the idea of remaining settlements in the state of Palestine there were two pre Palestinian preconditions. One is full Palestinian sovereignty, no Israeli security of uh, uh, responsibilities, authorities over the settlers of settlements, etc. Full Palestinian sovereignty. And so the settlements will become under the Palestinian law, Palestinian state law, and the settlements will be open to non-Jews. So Palestinian citizens and residents of the state of Palestine can build or buy property inside settlements. It will not be an exclusive Jewish set place. So this were, this were at that time, before the Second Intifada, uh, the Palestinian preconditions that I heard it from them. Now, with after the second Palestine Intifada, and more so during and after this conflict, uh, the Palestinians with whom I speak said, we are unwilling to take responsibility and authority on the lives of the settlers. They said, the, our people hate the settlers and they will murder them the moment that the IDF leaves the occupied territories. And we refuse to take responsibility for this murder. So you have to evacuate them. Now, from the Israeli side, the, the problem is that the security concept of, the, of, of Israel is that the, the state of Israel will, only the state of Israel 
will secure Israeli citizens elsewhere, elsewhere in Palestine or, or inside the state of Israel, exclusively, exclusively. This means keeping settlers and settlements inside the state of Palestine comes on the account of Palestinian sovereignty. It is impossible. Now, thinking on, let's say, 30, 50 years after peace, a, an option of settlers to establish a Jewish uh, or buy apartments in Ramallah or in the Hebron, maybe we can think about it. Maybe we can put it as an option in the peace process. But at the moment, taking the reality on the ground, it's a problem. Now, bottom line, evacuating about 600 settlers, 600,000 settlers, calling them back, will cause a civil war or an armed revolt against Israeli government. We must confront this fact. It happened in other societies. Actually, we in Israel now, uh, at the eve of the of recent conflict with the Palestinians, with the war, with the Gaza Strip, uh, were deep into a cold civil war. We managed a cold civil war between right wing and left wing, or center left. Uh, and this is just the introduction to what we may face in the future. It is not going to disappear. The problem of set settlers is a very serious problem. It may lead, if not to a civil war, to an, to an armed revolt by a small group. And part of the problem of any government making peace with the Palestinians and establishing and letting the Palestinians establish an independent state is the the Gover Israeli governments don't want to manage a armed struggle or to the state against its own citizens, even not against a small group that takes arms into their hands. But, but we have to keep in mind, Yitzhak Rabin was murdered without evacuating even a single room in a settlement, not an apartment, not a settlement, a single room, a tiny basement in a settlement was not, he did not order to evacuate in, in exchange of Oslo agreement, and he was murdered. So we have to bear it in mind. Menachem, thank you very much. Who wants to make short comment because we have few minutes of our first session? Um, who wants to make a comment? Uh, uh, Dr. Smirnov. We should not forget that uh, it's hot, uh, it's at, uh, Ariel Sharon, who entered the Al-Aqsa Mosque, you remember, which started the Second Intifada, evacuated settlements from Gaza. So everything in this world could see in a different uh, frameworks. But, uh, you know, uh, our first Russian ambassador in Israel, Mr. Alexander Bovin, uh, next week we shall have a special Bovin, Bovin hearings, the third one in our uh, institute. He always said everything possible which is not contrary to the laws of physics. So in the Middle East, this is the same. And as to the consideration between the two states, Israel and Palestine, also we have a good Russian saying, let's not divide the fear, the skin of the unkilled bear. So the peace process, the negotiating process is still far, far ahead. Let's better reach this aim. And the 
understanding between the, the, the two nations. This is something close to the laws of physics. It was very difficult to reach now. Can I add something? Sorry. Yes, yes, Vladislav. Yes, about settlement, I just want to remind that from the point of view of international law, which is expressed in the resolution of Security Council and General Assembly, the settlements are completely illegal, are completely illegal. This is a kind of annexation of territory of Palestine. This is my remark. Certainly. Thank you very much. Um, very important comment. Um, I think uh, we are going to finish our first sessions and to have some time to to drink coffee or tea or something. I'm personally thank you all our, of our speakers of the first sessions for their important um, presentation comments uh, and uh, their uh, their uh, ideas and thoughts uh, on uh, lessons from the Oslo process. I think we got a lot of interesting ideas to discuss, to process uh, after this first session. And I'm really, really glad that we have this webinar. We have these speakers and we are not going to uh, end this discussion, of course. Uh, we are going to uh, pro we are going to continue to make bridges between uh, scientific communities around the world and discuss these very necessary, very important issues um, like we are we are doing uh, today. So thank you very much, uh, and the big thanks to our listeners. I see your comments and I'm I'm honored and uh, thank you very much. So um, the next moderator will be Anne Novikova. She's going to be more perfect <laughs> moderator than I am always, um, than I was and um, big thanks. Uh, small, uh, little um, coffee break and we are going to continue. Thank you very much, thank you. Huh? Okay, thank you for everybody and hope to see you in the boarding readings. Yes, of course. Please, please, uh, our listeners, reg uh, register for boarding readings. It's all on our Telegram channel and on our site and everywhere, everywhere, everywhere these days. So please, please, please um, take your time to register for it. Thank you very, very much.
Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Welcome back to our webinar dedicated to the 30th anniversary of the Oslo Accords. And uh, uh, I shall be your moderator for the second part of today's webinar. My name is Anne Novikova. I'm the Senior Research Fellow at the Department for Israel and Jewish Communities at the Institute of Oriental Studies of Russian Academy of Science, as well as I'm the Associate Professor at the UNESCO Unit Fin uh, Affiliated Department on Culture, Peace and Democracy of the Faculty of Oriental Studies and Socio-Communicative Sciences at the Russian State University for the Humanities. Our part of the webinar is called The Israeli-Palestinian Conflict Today. Is a new Oslo process possible and or desirable? And uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker of this session, Dr. Anthony Carty, Professor Emeritus of Beijing Institute of Technology, and as well as a visiting professor to the Peking University, with the title of the presentation being the the Palestinian question, the dynamics of international legal assessments. Dr. Kati, are you with us? Unmuted. <clears throat> yes, I must apologize that I am uh, journeying and I'm in Paris eh, and I don't have uh, uh, Wi-Fi in my apartment and so I'm in a noisy restaurant, uh, but they seem to be tolerant of me more than they would be in other countries, and I'm allowed to speak and to listen to you. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be able to participate. Uh, <clears throat> I have not, because I didn't have Wi-Fi, able to listen to much of the discussion that took place before this time, and, uh, but nonetheless, I have some ideas which uh, I want to present to you. And I have uh, uh, basically 50 minutes is 27. So that presumably means that I can talk till about 10 to two, uh, but I may not need all that much time. I come from the North of Ireland and I have dual nationality. And I have written a book saying that the Good Friday Agreement and the power sharing could not work. And the reason for it being the irreconcilable political differences of the two so-called communities, the, the nationalist community and the unionist community. And I think that that view is being borne out by events. Uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of pressure put on both of these communities to reach agreement. Uh, in 1996, 1997, 1998. But they simply uh, cannot accept one another. They haven't resorted again to force. So that's a bit my background. I have written a book about that, Was Ireland Conquered? And then I have written a 60-page article uh, criticizing the Good Friday Agreement, which is in the Irish Book of International Law. Now, I want to make five points, which are quite theoretical. Uh, and that's my contribution, and uh, uh, maybe that when uh, Vladish Slav uh, comes up, he can be more practical and more constructive. Europe, and I, this is my impression of what I've heard of the meeting in the first session, is based on the liberal notion, discussion of differences, and a kind of transactional compromise between different types it's kind of the difference. I would maintain, along with Kissinger and a Russian Russian, that the only basis for the construction of stable international relations is a balance of power. And uh, international law can resolve frontier and state foundation questions, but only if there is a concert of powers to enforce it like you had the Congress of Vienna, and you had the setting up of the state of Belgium, the consensus about Austria, the consensus about Switzerland, and so on. It can only be done so law is not discussion. The essence of law is that for there of the community to insist on recalcitrant individuals in the community conforming to, uh, to the, the rules. Now, my third point is that there has never been a complete consensus in the international community on the foundation of Israel. That does lead to lots of technical legal arguments used by one side or the other, depending on whether you favor the Israelis or the Palestinians. Four lots of easy points here. 
but there's never been this consensus that the international community be willing to enforce. For instance, the mandate with the Jewish homeland has argued the promises of Palestinians during the First World War to the Arab generally. And uh, arguably, Ralph Walder, a professor at UCL, has just published an article in the Journal of the History of International Law saying that the mandate itself was in contradiction to the uh, uh, Versailles Peace Treaty. Uh, now, my fourth point is that Israel has always insisted that its existence and security depends only on itself and on no national lawyers have repeatedly its ideology, and this may be more controversial, but I have done a understanding of Israel, its ideology to the Palestinian to the Jewish people. Now this is a central thesis that they have, which is not from their point of view not negotiable. I, I took part in a conference in Berlin in March, which was extremely interesting, organized by the Catholic Academy in Berlin. And um, they have funding to for dialogue with Jewish scholars. There was a young American Jewish scholar who pointed out a way forward that Martin Buber, the greatest Jewish intellectual of the 20th century, he contested this view that, that the Bible, uh, under the Bible as a matter of interpretation of the Bible, that the, that the Jewish people were given uh, this land by God. He said there, there is no biblical authority for that. Now, there is a comparison here between Israel and Ireland, not simply that the Israeli terrorists or freedom fighters uh, of the mid-1940s were modeling themselves on the Irish freedom fighters from 1918 to 2021. <clears throat> but in Ireland also, there is a doctrine of Sinn Féin, ourselves alone, that there is actually no international law, and that if you have to, uh, countries have to force their own way into existence without the help of other countries. So I want to, uh, to if you want to criticize, if you want to criticize the Palestinians, you could say very well that from 19... 18, 1920 onwards, they've always been aware of the threat to them having any political autonomy in the Palestine mandate, and they have resisted it. So the re relations with these two communities have always been irreconcilable. And I think that is the basic problem that international relations theory has to consider. I mean, a law is based on the existence of community. Now, where you have two nations, the community is the international community. Now, if the international community cannot agree, and it's obvious at the moment that they cannot, then we have to be realistic about that. Now, a, fi a final point that I will make that will not appear so nihilistic is the international law of armed conflict is very highly developed. And here, it doesn't score any particular points for either side. The killing of civilians, unarmed particularly, civilians who are not carrying weapons and are not engaged in conflict, is a war crime and a crime against humanity. But at the same time, I don't think that this type of accusation of legal uh, of crime, uh, because cut off all infrastructure clearly called to the Geneva Convention 77 protocol. It's very clear that if the Israeli plan to uh, cut off resources from Gaza is it is that war crime and has is not because the international community is fighting and the Western community is very passionately in support of Israel. And I understand there's a great deal of sympathy for Israel in uh, Israel in Russia. I think my concluding point would be that the essence of the United Nations Charter is that ethnic disputes among nations are not resolvable philosophically or through discourse or dialogue. And therefore, there has to be an absolute prohibition of the use of force. 
But that means, uh, from an international law point of view, that the Security Council, that the concert of the great powers, have to be able to coerce the two sides into to some kind of settlement, uh, and then insist upon it. And I think anything else is simply unrealistic, given the very nature of law and the very nature of community. So while I think having very earnest conversations about how to compromise or find a compromise between perhaps Arabs living in Israel and, and Jews living in the West Bank, I think this is very worthy, but it is simply completely unrealistic from a legal point of view. So I, I would really wish I was not trying to make this presentation in a very noisy restaurant in Paris. Uh, and I will try my best to follow what uh, Vladislav has to say afterwards. And I'm open to any kind of questions and discussion. But I think I would stress, I do speak from the authority of somebody from within a very similar conflict. Our family, our businesses were all burned out in pogroms whereby so-called unionists wiped out uh, nationalist populations in large parts of East Belfast, and I am essentially a refugee. I mean, I'm not living in that place, and I was told when I was 20 to 21 not to try to, from, from, by well-disposed unionists who thought that life would not be worth it living in such a place. So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to express these views. Uh, I think we have to focus on what is needed, which is frankly Russia, China, America, India, these and Europe. These countries have got to start talking to one another and stop. Uh, I do think there is a widespread view among international lawyers that law is simply hijacked as a weapon to abuse those with whom one disagrees. Uh, and I think that gets us nowhere. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carty, for raising a very important question on the power dynamics whenever a conflict of such high intensity, as well as high moral involvement and uh, long generational trauma that may stand, uh, start within this particular conflict and how that will influence the process, the possibility of outcomes. Uh, to our esteemed audience, to our listeners and people that have joined the webinar, please do not forget to use the chat function to post your questions to any of the speakers. I will remind you that uh, once all of the speakers have completed their presentations, we will have a Q&A session where there will be a more open discussion on topics and points made by our guests. Thank you very much, Dr. Kati. Uh, and we shall be moving on to Dr. Vladislav Talstych, leading research fellow at the Center for Arabic and Islamic Studies at uh, Institute of Oriental Studies of Russian Academy of Science. Uh, Dr. Talstych, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. So I, the same, I don't want to talk much about Oslo Agreement because from point of view of international law, they, they don't influence the solution of any of problems which divide Israel and Palestine, except maybe the problem, the issue of distribution of water resources. All the important problems are regulated by other instruments of international law. So I, I would like to talk about the shift in the development of international legal discourse of both parties which we can uh, uh, contemplate in recent times. As for Israel, I think this is my impression that Israel tried to foster, to advance the idea of one state, the one state solution. And one step in this process is annexation of the West Bank. And now we see that maybe uh, we will talk about annexation of Gaza, sector Gaza. So I see that the following sign of this intent Firstly, uh, there are some authoritative publications like Paradigm Lost in recent Israeli doctrine, which fosters this idea. Second, we see some new laws like, for example, law One Nation, One State, which also uh, can be considered as a preparing for uh, this annexation. Third, uh, the deal of the century, which is uh, uh, completely unacceptable for Palestinians from the advance, from the beginning. And fourth, Israel, it's very interesting for me as a lawyer, Israel tried to rehabilitate 
old theories which is used 20, 30 years ago to justify, to substantiate this historical title over all the earth, all, 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 all the land of Palestine, like Mission Reversement, for example. We can see it in a report prepared by Commission Levy in uh, uh, 2012, I think. As for Palestine, Palestine also uh, tried to shift, try to transform its international legal discourse. And here we see uh, another accent. Firstly, we can talk about and shift from the international humanitarian law, international law of uh, human rights to another institute of international law, law of international responsibility. We see that some Palestinian authors and international organization insist on the fact that Israel controls settlements, controls settlers, and that's why their construction must be attributed to Israel as a state. And like that, Palestinian also try to, to, to exclude the argument of Israel according to which the settlement activity doesn't violate the Article 49 of uh, Geneva Convention 4. Second, um, some also some specialists say that, uh, uh, that um, we have to uh, to, 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 to refuse the idea of bilateral negotiations. Because if you consider the activity of Israel, this activity is a crime. And when someone commits a crime, it's, it's irrational, it's illegal to ask the victim to make negotiations with the uh, violator. Third, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, the consequence which Palestine tried to draw from these uh, arguments is that every state in the world have to apply sanctions and counter measures against Israel. Must to, to, to consider the activity of Israel as a big and grave violation of uh, the norms used against, which is the most important norms in international law. And second, um, shift in uh, the position of Palestine is judicialization of the conflict, in the sense that um, Palestine tried to, 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 to ask international courts to support this position. And now we have two big processes in the International Court of Justice. And at the beginning of 2023, General Assembly asked it, um, uh, International Court of Justice, what are consequences of uh, the grave violation of Israel, of rules of international law in occupied territories. Uh, then my next point, we have a very, very deep codex, which uh, lives in Great Britain, whose name is China Mievit, Tony, I'm sure that you read his book, Between Equal Rights, the Force Decides. And we see two legal positions, All, both positions are substantiated are argued by different kind of reasons. But what decides, this is force which decides. And I think that uh, Israel can, can annex the territory of the West Bank and can use, can use quite solid argumentation for it. What argumentation? I would like to, 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 to uh, I, I would like to, 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 to speak about five main arguments. First argument is self-defense. Self-defense, which must be measured against the goals of Israel, against the goals. As Israel needs to exist, Israel can use all means to protect its existence, including annexation of the territory. Second argument is in ineffectivity is a uh, uh, inutility of negotiations. And here Israel can base on the Kosovo precedent when Kosovo declared its ind independence after negotiations under within regime created by Security Council uh, turned out to be useless. Uh, my third, ag third argument of the Israel is a um, protection of human rights. Israel can insist that 
the annexation of the West Bank is necessary. It is necessary to protect human rights of settlers as well as human rights of Palestinians who live there. The first argument is quite difficult because it's very technical, the argument of a stopping. Israel can insist that um, while international community do not apply sanctions against him, in such a way, international community recognize titles of Israel over all the territory of the West Bank. Because, because the one state solution is a reality, is a reality. And because no, as no state, no state challenges this reality, it means that every state recognizes it. I think that I'm clear. And my and last argument is argument based on the system of mandate of, of the declaration of Balfour, the classical argument according to which the history of uh, Israel and Palestine was decided one century ago. So my, my conclusion, I think that uh, three days ago, events will transform the political reality and legal reality as well. As for political reality, I think that we will see destruction and annexation of Gaza. We will see annexation of the West Bank and we will see a complete stigmatization of Palestinians which will make all their attempts to call for justice, to apply to international court, completely useless. And maybe this situation is related to a broader economical context concerning creations of new economical corridor, India, uh, uh, between India and Europe. This is, uh, how to say, it can be considered as a conspiracy theory, but we must understand that this is very, very important economical context. I don't know how these things interrelated, but I'm sure that they are linked one with, with, with another. And the consequence will be tragic as well for international law, for international law. Uh, there will be introduction of a new concept of self-defense, unlimited self-defense, unlimited self-defense. So we, in fact, we have to forget the law of the force, so prohibition of force in international law. Second consequence is that uh, now we see that uh, uh, how to say, collective punishment become legitimate tool of self-defense. If we talk about Israel, it's very, very sad events. But we see now that today I saw news that three uh, hundred thousand people abandoned their homes in Gaza. And nobody, except maybe some officials from United Nations, protest against it. And last, the third consequence is that uh, the actions, the situations, events in Gaza three days ago re-establish, re re rehabilitate the old concept of international law, the old Im image of international law, which was based on the idea of hostile money generis, of enemy of human race to exist human race needs an enemy. So for me, as international law, it's a big, big tragedy what was happened three days ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Talstuch. I think that we have mentioned another very important concept for the modern world. Uh, and while you describe some theories and hypotheticals as conspiracy theories, we must recognize that, that in the modern world, which is dominated by social media, as well as self-appointed uh, specialists who dominate the media space, conspiracy theories in the post-truth society determine the 
general attitude of people towards the ongoing events, as well as those people in democratic societies and within the international law are subject to voicing those opinions, as well as acting upon them. Thank you very much, Dr. Talstich. Next up, we have uh, Doc, uh, Daniel Levy, President of the United States Middle East Project. Uh, uh, Dr. Hlebnikova, is Mr. Levy ready or is he, because I didn't no, see him. No, he's mm -hmm. not ready. I think that uh, Professor Naum can caught him <laughs> <laughs> for quite time, but I think we can switch my presentation with Daniel Levy. I think it will be fine. That was that what uh, that was I was hoping to do. So while uh, uh, Mr. Levy is uh, uh, currently under the occupational hazard of being present in the Russian Academy of Science, uh, I introduce to you our favorite speaker, our moderator of the first part, Dr. Luisa Hlebnikova, Associate Professor at the Department for Jewish Studies of Institute of Asian and African Studies of Moscow State Institute, named after Mikhail Manosov, and my a genuine research fellow at uh, the Department for Israel and Jewish Communities of the uh, Institute of Oriental Studies of Russian Academy of Science, with a presentation dedicated to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict settlement from equations to formulas. Dr. Hlebnikova, the platform is yours. First of all, uh, big thanks to Anne for perfectly moderating uh, this session. Thank you very much. Um, it's my honor uh, to present my thoughts and ideas uh, next to such amazing people and experts. Uh, I'm really uh, honored to do so. Um, and I think I got lucky today because it's very, very hard to speak after Daniel Levy because he's, he's always on point. So uh, I'm lucky to do um, my small presentation before him. Um, anyway, uh, today uh, we have been discussing the Oslo uh, process of the 90s, uh, its limitations, its uh, lessons. Um, so I would like to start uh, that we are living in post-Oslo reality some mechanism of uh, Oslo process are not relevant for today, it's obvious, but some of them are still working, um, like the division of the West Bank, formation of um, Palestinian Authority, self-governments of Palestine, uh, formation of their security forces, etc. As we heard from the first session, there are different approaches how we study the Oslo process. Oslo was good, Oslo was bad, Oslo was doomed from the beginning uh, or not. In some way, I feel that it's, um, it's a battle of uh, memory uh, narratives uh it's a battle of uh, approaches of different scientific approaches and um, uh, we know that after oslo process there was some attempts to have uh, israeli palestinian negotiations uh, but unfortunately they all failed Today, we can see that Israel uh, is a more strong party of this conflict. First of all, Israel, Israel is a sovereign independent state with the army, eco economics, etc. Israel today, uh, for the Middle East uh, region, it's a um, regional power. Uh, at the same time, we see that Israel in a deep political and not only political crisis. Uh, we just saw this horrific uh, terror attack, uh, and we saw in the life, you know, on social medias, um, on uh, different sites, we we saw how fragile uh, Israel. Uh, um, but still, it's a state. Uh, Palestine, it's a quasi-state. We can debate this term, but it's not a 
full state. No, it's quasi state with divided territory. Uh, there are inter Palestinian conflicts, uh, different uh, parties, uh, and uh, for now, for, for not only now, for, for more than a decade, um, uh, Hamas, one of the uh, major players there. Uh, by the way, I have to say this, that for many years I thought, and I was wrong, actually, that Hamas uh, had almost the same uh, the same line like uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization, for example, from uh, organizations uh, from uh, organization to political party uh, and different charters of Hamas. And um, I, among uh, other experts, we thought that Hamas will be uh, like um, PLO um, and uh, there will be some reforms uh, towards its approach to Israel. Uh, the last chart uh, was less radical as, um, as we thought. But nowadays we see that it's not it's not like like this anymore. Um, so it's a different party and there are different um, different issues and dimensions in both parties of this conflict. They are not equal, of course. Uh, I would like to stress that in both societies, there is a clash of narratives, clash of collective memory and clash of uh, collective traumas, Israeli Jewish collective trauma and uh, Pal uh, Palestinian Ar Ar Arabic collective trauma. In both societies, and as uh, Dr. Nasenka just told us, there is a strong disappointment of peace initiatives, uh, not only Oslo process. And today we can see that compromise, compromise means weakness. Weakness means losing. And we can see that at the same time, there is a strong, um, strong uh, dehumanization to, of another party of the conflict in the both societies. Uh, of course, uh, nowadays there is a huge escalation and huge uh, tragic, horrific events and um, people are willing to uh, use um, harsh words and they are willing to to think about violence, but in general, uh, for many decades, it's a it's a full dehumanization um, uh, of um, another part of the conflict. Uh, today, uh, we are uh, during the, our first session, uh, we were talking about conflict resolutions and about. Uh, moderator, who is going to be moderator, who, who is the better moderator today. Uh, I always tell uh, my students, and not only, that trust between sides of the conflict is not the main element of the su success, it's my opinion, but guarantees are. So there is a need of moderator, but unfortunately today we can see that there is no state that want to be actively involved in the peace process between Israel and Palestine. For many decades, uh, uh, it was the United States, uh, as Dr. Smirnov uh, today told us that there was a there is a Middle East Quartet, uh, but uh, we can see that um, uh, we we don't see many involvement and. Uh, we do not see that uh, it actually uh, it's it's working, um, and um, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, it's of course uh, Daniel who is with us. Uh, he's he can talk more about the United States policy, but we can see also that domestic and foreign policy in the United States. Uh, I d different prioritize 
uh, than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolution. Um, and of course, Israel uh, is not going to be part of some you know, international conference or some multilateral approach. You know, we, we know it from Israel history that um, Israel is not going to participate in this kind of approach. Uh, and uh, today, uh, also, I have to make this point that in the last decade, at least in the last decade, uh, there is a polemics among um, experts, among researchers, around uh, different projects of solutions, two-state solution, one-state solution. Uh, one-state solution, it's uh, um, one state with a Jewish minor minority, but with no equal rights for, for Palestinians. And also, we just discussed uh, this, uh, another one solution, it's, it's the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation. So different uh, solutions uh, we can discuss. I hope we are going to do it uh, very soon. Uh, I'm, I really hope to make this web webinar on different kind of solution of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. But for now, we can see that the reality on the ground uh, is, uh, is um, like this one, that two-state solutions is not uh, is not relevant today due this reality uh, on the ground, and we are now looking what is going to happen to uh, uh, to Gaza these days. So, um, but before it, the reality uh, of this settlement activity, annexation, uh, um, etc., uh, made. Uh, Two state solutions uh, are not uh, unfortunately relevant. Uh, I myself, uh, for many years, a strong supporter of two state solutions uh, for many reasons, but the reality is uh, there. Uh, and it's a devastating reality of this conflict, of course, uh, for both sides and for the region. Um, uh, in the title of this session, there is a question. Is a new Oslo process possible and or desirable? Actually, uh, it's Daniel uh, who gave me uh, this idea to uh, have this title. And unfortunately, we all can see that it's not desirable by two sides of this conflict. And actually, by any sides. Uh, I, I don't want to repeat uh, my uh my um my uh, my my words about that there is no real moderator or moderator who wants to be actively involved to resolve this uh conflict uh the global regional and domestic reality of palestine and israel is much much different than it was in the 90s uh and the current reality, uh, current reality is not hopeful, uh, but I believe that peace is only answer for Israel, Palestine, uh, and actually the region and the global community as well. Uh, and this is my last point. Uh, I'm generally <laughs> hopeless but we need to have some hope, some hope for peace. And uh, we as researchers are going to continue to study this conflict, uh, to, um, to be involved in, uh, in, um, in research in this conflict, because it's very, very important to keep uh, researching this conflict. I know for a fact that uh, for the last decade uh, in uh, Russia, there is um, there is not so uh, many young scholars are not so interested to study this conflict, but I ask you, please 
do research this conflict, do research Israel and Palestine and uh, and our region. So thank you very much. Sorry for being <laughs> out of time. <laughs> thank you very much, Anne. And Daniel is here, so hey. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> you raised a very poignant point about there being no volunteers to somehow moderate the conflict uh, in its current state. And the fact that there are no volunteers is definitely not going to help the situation, which uh, only brings back the importance of not only of the statehoods and their responsibilities, but also the individuals who may be the, uh, the initiators of various progresses, such as the uh, former Senator George Mitchell, who has had a, a hand to play in both the Good Friday agreements that were already mentioned today, as well as the investigation of the Mitchell reports during the early 2000s Arab-Israeli conflict. Thank you, Dr. Hlebnikova. I would like to remind everybody to put your questions in chat so we can answer them during the Q&A session. And uh, finally, we have Mr. Daniel Levy, President of the United States Middle East Project, with a presentation currently titled After 30 Years, How Peace making must adapt to new local and geopolitical realities on Israel-Palestine. Mr. Levy, the platform is yours. Thank you so much, um, Anne, and, and it's it's good to be here. And Louisa, thank you for welcoming me. I can only apologize that, that I didn't think I'd be able to be here at all, but I'm very pleased that I'm here, um, even if briefly, and I, and I this is not something I, I like to do, so I apologize. Um, to the other speakers who I won't get a chance to, to hear from and uh, and to those of you who are joining us. And I'm going to be very brief. Um, and, and actually something that was just said, and, and I'm not going to give a, a, a whole lecture, I'm going to give you some just some very brief ref reflections. Um, but I actually want to start because it, 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 it's something that I spent a lot of yesterday talking and thinking about, this question of the mutual dehumanization and how far it has gone, because I don't think, and how, what one does about it, and, and it's a challenge for, for, for researchers, because I don't think we could have seen the appalling, heartbreaking scenes from the weekend if civilians, if, 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 on, if for the, those Palestinians who carried out those acts, Israel, Israelis had not been so dehumanized. And I do not think we would be seeing what we're seeing now in Gaza, which, which has me shuddering and trembling, cutting off the supplies to the entire 2.2 million civilian population, and the, the flattening of Gaza and the, the, I mean, I really shudder to think how this is gonna play out in the coming days. That couldn't be possible if Palestinians weren't so thoroughly dehumanized um, in Israel amongst Israeli Zionist Jews. And, you know, the, this absolute absence of a distinction between civilians and combatants. And Israel claims, no, of course, we're just getting Hamas. Uh, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not serious. What Israel is doing is as much as a, of a premeditated war crime as what, uh, what Hamas did on the weekend. So, and it made me think that, you know, the targeting of civilians has really been a, it's a feature of most conflicts. And it's been a feature of this conflict. The fact that the reason there are so many Palestinian refugees in Gaza is because they were driven out as civilians of their homes during the Nakba and the great um, expansive ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Um, let me, you, you've spoken this morning, and, and I'm sure I'll hear about it, of the, the failures of Oslo. And so I'm going to really cut short what I was going to offer and, uh, and and leave just three thoughts that, that are the things that as, in my work I've identified as the, as the things that we'll most have to, to do differently going forward uh, if we're going to have a chance of a different outcome. Um, and I'm afraid, you know, a lot of it comes down to that we don't have uh, an external actor who, who at the moment is, is able to constructively work on this, on this file. But the three items, and that's the third one of them actually, but the three items are that Israel has been offered, I think a terrible deal by its so-called friends and allies in the West, which is we will guarantee 
that you face no accountability or costs and consequences from the way you treat the Palestinians. And, you know, this has encouraged Israel to avoid the hard choices. So the Israelis have internalized the idea that the Palestinian situation can be relatively easily managed, but relatively low cost, because there's going to be no accounting for what Israel does. And I think in internalizing that fact, Israel became complacent. And so I, I do see a direct causal link between the signals that have been sent to Israel over many, many years of impunity and the hubris which made possible the failure on the weekend. I, th I think Israelis just don't see Palestinians as capable of causing, inflicting that kind of pain. And partly that's, that's the hubris. Now, I don't know how one circles back and changes the Israeli calculation. Many of us argued for many years that if a political path wasn't found, and this is kind of obvious, if a political path wasn't found, if, Israel, if Israel's incentive structure could not be impacted politically, then this is what happens in, in, in so many historical examples. Then the people whose rights have been denied will resort to violence. And so that's, that's where we found ourselves. Um, and I think that the first prerequisite for meaningful future negotiations is that Israelis come to the table no longer feeling that they can do anything to the Palestinians, feeling that they actually have to make a choice. Here. The second thing that I think needs to happen is that the Palestinian body politic needs to reassemble itself. You know, part of the story is Hamas is in control in Gaza, Fatah is not in control in the West Bank. It has these little islands of limited self-governance surrounded by Israel. It's largely been co-opted into the status quo. And sorry, there's a helicopter flying overhead. I'm in London. Um, I don't know if you can hear the noise. The, uh, and, you know, the, the PLO, Fatah, made this choice uh, really in the 80s. And it came to fruition in Oslo 30 years ago. And I'm, I'm, and I'm sure this was discussed earlier. And the choice was withdraw from armed struggle, uh, negotiated outcome, accept a state on 22%. And the Israelis never really took that seriously. And set, illegal settlements quadrupled over this time. The occupation became more entrenched, not more withdrawn. And so uh, and the, the, the Fatah, the PA, does security cooperation with Israel to protect Israelis, not to protect its own people. And so they've lost all credibility. And part of why Hamas did what it did is I think it did that in response to PA weakness, knowing and correctly that this would be popular and that maybe the, the PA may even tip over and collapse. We're not seeing signs of, of, of a deeper collapse yet, but it's, it's early days. <clears throat> Excuse me. So... This division, which obviously, you know, again, you don't need to know too much history to know that if you're an, an occupying power trying to rule over a, 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 another people in an oppressive way, if you can divide those people, you're much more likely to be successful. So this Palestinian division is debilitating. It means the Palestinians don't have a strategy. It means they can't effectively challenge Israel and can't affect that cost benefit equation. And, um, and actually it means that the question that Louisa just talked about, which is, you, you shared with us that you've always favored a two-state solution, other people are looking at, at other options. I actually think we're in no position at all to answer that question because you don't have a Palestinian central movement that represents the Palestinian people that can effectively articulate what it wants and how it's going to get there. And you, on the Israeli side, there's, there's no urgency perceived in the need to address what we're going to do in, in the, with the Palestinians in the future. The only urgent question today is, what, but perhaps the urgent question is what will happen in the future of Gaza? 
uh, you know, who's going to run Gaza. The last thing that I think was uh, wholly absent in Oslo and would need to be rectified to have a meaningful future negotiating process is, is the question that, that we touched on there of who is the outside, who are the conveners, right? Who are the peace brokers? Is there a contact group? The quartet existed, but it was really America pretending uh, that, that it was working with others. And the Israelis never took the quartet seriously and, and because the Americans never took the quartet seriously enough. Actually, it could have been the kind of contact group that we were lacking early on in Oslo. But America, but America chose to accept Israel's decision that, no, we will still deal with America. And the American monopoly on this issue has totally failed. I think, you know, I, I, I imagine people are at least aware of what President Biden said. I think America's doing itself huge self-harm in the way it positions itself on this. But anyway, the, the key point is that, that um, we don't have... Uh, an international architecture for trying to work a, 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 a structure of peace. Now, Russia has done stuff on that question of Palestinian division, has offered to host a conference. You know, these aren't the circumstances in which you know, I think there's going to be Russian leadership on this file. I think China is not looking to insert itself in, as it did on Saudi Iran because there was, there was ripeness there. There is not ripeness here. However, we're going to have, and, and I think this is, you know, in, in this respect, Israel-Palestine is not unique at all. In this respect, you know, sometimes it gets put out on a different planet. So, that, you know, it's as if Israel-Palestine doesn't exist in a broader geopolitical context, but it does. And in this respect, the challenge is not just for the Israeli-Palestinian question, but the challenge is global. Uh, can we create an arc? You know, the UN is basically stimmied across a range of issues. Can we create uh, something that approximates uh, a, a problem solving way forward? And that's going to have to involve a really different cast of characters. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to leave you, but I, I'll, I, I can just share with you that my own work now, uh, until this weekend, was increasingly involved with looking at. Yeah, everyone talks about the mid-levels powers of the global south, the emerged powers. Is there an appetite in some of these countries to lean in a bit more on the Palestinian-Israeli issue to, to, to assume more of a role? And, and that, that's something that I'm interested in exploring. I, um, it's, it's extremely rude of me. And as a Brit, we kind of at least like to pretend that we're very polite. So I feel, I feel terrible that I'm, I'm kind of coming, talking and leaving. But I, I, I let Louisa know that that was sadly my, my um, situation today. And, and excuse me for that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Daniel, thank you. Aww. Thank you very much, Mr. Levy. Thank you for making time for us today. I know that your schedule is beyond busy, considering your general line of work as well as the influence of the ongoing events. And we hope that in the future, we will be able to find more opportunities to host you and to have more productive discussions on various topics. Uh, I very much hope so. I really do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, esteemed colleagues, uh, uh, our dearest listeners, please, uh, uh, we are now, as uh, our speakers have finished their addresses, we are now moving on towards our Q&A session where you are encouraged to ask any questions to one another, to ask our speakers. And I know that uh, uh, Tatiana Vsevolodna uh, had a question to Dr. Talstich. And uh, uh, Danila, if you would be so kind as to connect us, Yep, and then, uh, and can you give me a floor just for one comment? Uh, of course. Thank you. Uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, my question to Dr. Dostig. Uh I understood that uh, you were talking about the annexation, which is in the prospect, and that is uh, the most, so from your point of view, it's a very uh, uh, re real, uh, future for the whole situation. 
And I would like to ask you, how do you see the compatibility of the annexation project with the democratic character of the uh, state of Israel? How I mean, will that... they, how will they okay. manage to keep all those people uh, who are so hostile to them without giving them uh, uh, the civil rights uh, and uh, which is out of question as I know now for the Israel, Israel government, uh, how will they keep them under their control and what will become of the democratic uh, principles of the state it is founded on? Thank you. I think that when we when we consider some recent laws uh, uh, which were adopted in Israel, they already uh, are against democratic principles. But you are right in the sense that the decision about annexations will be global and much more strong. But I, I'm quite skeptical about law in general. And I think that law can be used as as a tool, as a tool to convince the people that democratic principles are not violated. And I wanted just to say, to say that there are some legal justifications which can seem quite solid, quite strong, and which have convincing force. So I think that Israel as any, every state can use these arguments and can convince international community as well as uh, people of Israel that everything is okay with democracy, international law, and the future and human rights. We not, we, I want just to add, we have now critical uh, theory of international law, which is very popular, which is criticized by Anthony Carty. And the, I, I just want to repeat, we talked about one week ago that the, the essence of international law is a dispute, is not a picture of the world. This is a dispute. And the winner is the party which uses the strongest arguments. This is my answer. Well, we are disputing there are people who live their lives and what will be with them. With the people who live where? Who live their lives. People who live their lives. Yes. Mm. And what will be with them while there is a discussion about the international war? You, you and, talk about uh, people who live in, in the West Bank? Uh, I, I, I mean people in... Uh, uh, both in Israel and uh, in the in Palestine, human beings. Human uh, beings. Yes, as uh, uh, I'm saying, uh, told. You, you mean I don't I don't really understand the question. They will live in a new reality. Why not? I mean, I mean, what will be this? What what society will it be? Well, the international law uh, will be absolutely indifferent to what is happening there uh, while discussing those uh, new ways and principles to apply and how will people live and how will they survive without any kind of law? This, why would, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that there will be no law. There will some laws, there will be some rights, but political structure will be changes, it's old. It's this is it is not new in the history. We have some precedents, so I don't see any catastrophic in this scenario from the point of view of law. The discourse will be changed. The political structure will be transformed. Some new laws will be adopted. Letting, <laughs> letting kill people without any uh, reasons and without any. Uh, without any basis for that, do you mean that? 
esteemed colleagues, I believe uh, that Dr. Uh, Kati would also like to yeah. ask a question or make yeah. a remark. Yeah. Well, I, I would like to, uh, uh, if I understand the discussion, I, I would like to uh, come in to say that it's all very well saying that, well, people, where are people going to be? What's going to happen? They're right. I think we have a chance to solve the problem when we realize the gravity of the problem. And I, I would agree with everything that Mr. Levi has been saying, coming from Britain, as I came from Britain myself yesterday. You have to face the fact that international society is a no man's land. There's lots of, talk, lots of talk about rights, but you have, there are no rights. And there are only going to be rights if the international concert of powers can come together and express a willingness to insist on rights. To my mind, you cannot negotiate with the state of Israel. It's nonsense. This, the, uh, the, Mr. Levi made the whole point I think very clear, and you can speak with some authority. Uh, the situation is beyond repair, and, and basically, one basically is dealing with a pathological criminal situation that can only be dealt with through a superior coercive community power. There are no rights if there is not a power of the state to enforce them. There are no rights of states if there's not a power of the international society to enforce them. If we have clarity about that, then there is some possibility of going forward. But I'm not sure we're going backwards at the moment. The situation in the international community has probably never been worse than it is at the moment. And uh, Russia has a huge role to play with China. That's why I'm in China. And that's why I'm so keen to participate in a seminar with Russia. I think that it's fascinating to hear your opinion instead of boycotting you because we disapprove of you. As a Westerner, I think the main problem with international society is the extraordinary moral uh, arrogance of, of Western countries. Uh, this is baffling to me. I don't know where Westerners get this sense of their superiority. I just wanted to say that. I mean, I think this is a, a conversation which I hope we can continue. Okay, thank you, Dr. Carty. That is indeed something that we must uh, also consider. And uh, this reminds me of the classic work by Edward Said, Orientalism, where he discusses the potential ways uh, that the othering of various nations and cultures has been happening from the lens of the more Eurocentric and uh, uh, America-centric viewpoints and cultures and how that also inevitably colors the international law and the process of decision making uh, on the international scale. Uh, uh, Irina Ineshina expresses her gratitude to the discussion and uh, that uh, we have a very weighted approach to the topic. Uh, Irina, we are very happy that you enjoyed the discussion. Uh, other questions, esteemed yeah. colleagues, and uh, I apologize, Louisa, you had a... Yeah, can I have a one quick comment? Uh, actually, to my small presentation, in some way, uh, it's, um, it's a comment to Daniel Levy, and I'm going to email him this one. I, I think it's very important to say when we are going, uh, when we are discussing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, conflict resolution, it's very, uh, it's very important to say that uh, during the Oslo process, both sides did not sell peace to the societies, uh, and uh, these days there are there is no work with the society uh, in both Palestine and Israel. How peace uh, is important because different as. I already said it uh, during my presentation, different narratives, uh, compromise uh, is a weakness, weakness is a losing, etc. But even during the Oslo process, um, there is there was a huge problem that the, um, the Oslo process divided uh, Israel, divided Palestine, and the authorities did not make uh, any um, strong steps to sell this uh, peace uh, process to the 
public. Uh, I think it's a it was a great mistake. Uh, and uh, today, uh, um, I would like to uh, even quote in some way to uh, my students and our colleague Danila Golubev, who just wrote that in the current reality, um, the key element of the conflict, uh, it's uh, propaganda and uh, everything that is going on in uh, social media, uh, then it's easier to, uh, to sell some ideas, uh, to um to uh to sell some ideas even radical ones um and uh uh there is a, a strong necessity to work with young people as uh, daniela golubev just wrote in our telegram uh chat uh telegram group that it's very important to work with young people using new ways and um uh, new uh, ways of dialogue, uh, and uh, uh, it's it's very uh, important to do so as well to uh, to uh, to make peace is more popular, to make it more popular. Um, so this is what my comment uh, is, just a small one. That's it's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Smirnov. Yes, Dr. Yeah. Smirnov, Viktor Yurevich. Uh, referring to what uh, our beautiful Louisa said just now concerning the young generation, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all young generation, uh, all young uh, researchers use very beautiful word discourse and so on and so on. But I think from time to time it is very necessary to, to, to take old files of newspapers and to read. Today we didn't use not once a very too beautiful world which we are relating to the Middle East conflict. Reaching just comprehensive settlement. Maybe a new generation of Oslo advocates will start discussing from the legalistic, from the uh, point of view of international law, what does it mean just in this context? What does it mean comprehensive? in this context, or is it already old fashioned words of communist epoch and so on and so on and so on. But just is a good word, by the way, referring to settlement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smirnov. I would also like to remember something that was um, told at least uh, to, to us. Uh, we were students back then at the uh, Center for Biblical and Judaical Studies at uh, my university. Uh, Dr. Eliezer Diamond said something along the lines that 80% of Israelis do not want to be in conflict with Palestinians, and 80% of Palestinians do not want to be in conflict with Israelis. The problem lies that either side does not believe in the existence of the other one. That is uh, returning to the comment made by uh, Louisa that uh, there is a lack of communication. There was a blatant lack of communication between the leaders that signed the Oslo Accords with their own population to try to explain the implications yeah. of the signed agreement. And that is partly why currently there is such an emphasis on communications actually made by either side in the current ongoing conflict between Israel and Gaza, saying that political communication from leaders to, to the population has not improved in the past 30 years. And that is something that I think will factor in a large way in the possibility of conflict resolution. Thank you, dearest uh, guests and colleagues. Other questions? Maybe our guests, please do not uh, feel shy to use the chat function to ask your questions. We still have time to promote a little bit more of a discussion on a very complicated topic. As uh, so far, there appear to be no other questions. I'm, I'm going to pretend that we have comprehensively covered uh, the issue on all sides. Uh, oh, there is one. Yes. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Stelmark asks, uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, he thanks uh, the speakers for uh, your presentations and uh, the question, in your opinion, what is the role of Turkey in modern realities in this region? What do you think about the role of uh, uh, Turkey as a state and particular Recep Tayyip Erdogan as the leader of the Turkish state in the ongoing conflict and win within the region? I can answer this question. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it's um, uh, it's question to not to our webinar today, but still, uh, it's uh, important to talk about Turkey and Turkey's role in the region. It's um, one of the key actors, uh, regional actors uh, in the Middle East, uh, very powerful and very strong one. So Turkey, uh, of course, um, is a very important actor in the region. Uh, but as to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, as far as I see, I'm not in, uh, from Turkish, uh, from studies of Turkey and its foreign and domestic policy. But yeah, in some way, Turkey is involved, uh, but uh, partly uh, in the conflict. And I think it's uh, um, Turkey uses this conflict uh, to achieve some um uh, interests uh, in the region uh turkey has uh, relations uh with uh, hamas uh and with um, palestinian authority and turkey now has uh, uh relations with israel as well they just re established relations so I, I as far as i see the israel palestinian conflict for turkey uh it's element of uh, broader regional strategy and uh I think Turkey needs it for some PR or for some national interests. Um, uh, so we need, if we want to talk about different regional actors in the Israel-Palestinian conflict, I think we need to ask to come some experts from Turkey uh, study, uh, Turkey studies or Arabic studies, uh, more, I mean, more Arabists, uh, etc. And we can have this webinar about different actors, regional actors, global actors, etc. Thank you very much, Louisa. Uh, esteemed colleagues, once again, I remind you that the question is what, in your opinion, is the role of Turkey in uh, the region and how it relates to the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, considering that Turkey really tries to position itself right in the middle of it? I think that we can say that we are all in agreement with the uh, comment made by Dr. Hlebnikova in uh, this particular uh, case, that yes, Turkey is a powerful, notable player, but that has their own interests, which they will pursue, regardless of the outcome of what we are talking about today. So, Dr. Hlebnikova, I believe that we should be moving towards the closing remarks of yep. our today's webinar. Yep, I agree. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Anne uh, for being a really perfect moderator of our second session uh, of our event. Um, big thanks to every speaker, to every listeners who tuned in in our event and uh, made their impact how this event um, just went. Uh, big thanks to my colleagues to support uh, my idea to have this webinar. Um, big thanks to every person who helps uh, who helped uh, organize this event. Um, I'm honored uh, and grateful to all of you. Uh, and we are going to continue to study, to talk, to have some debates, of course, on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, a conflict uh, and uh, once again thank you all uh, big big thanks to everyone stay tuned to our events uh, from uh, to our events on telegram channel and our site uh, um, thank you all thank you all thank you everybody and goodbye thank you very much
Oh, Kiara. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oops.